Um, Roger, can I start with you? Uh, the, the historical documentary that's meant something to you? Um, well, there's many. Uh, I, and I think uh, D.A. Penny Baker, obviously. And um, uh, um, one of the, the films that, um, you know, when I was thinking of becoming a documentarian, um, one of the first documentaries I saw was um, actually Maisel's, actually the, the uh, salesman. And I um, was um, sort of uh, blown away by how um, you could um, really sort of um, spend time and get to know someone in, a, um, in such a sort of intimate way. Uh, and, uh, and then obviously don't look back. Um, uh, there's so many in incredible music documentaries, uh, and I and the, I wanted to make a historical music documentary um, because of those films. Uh, so, the Apollo, you know, with its 85 years of history, was a sort of a huge uh, <laughs> challenge to me. When, when you were getting into it, do you take time to watch a bunch of other music documentaries, or do you kind of stay away from watching those music documentaries to give your own space? away because I had so much footage to watch from this for this <laughs> I mean it was overwhelming so I didn't really watch a lot of uh, a lot of stuff I had watched endless amounts of performances and footage of the Apollo that sounds like a good life yeah. <laughs> um, Ryan let me ask you uh, a film that engages with history that has meaning for you well when I when I was making ask dr. Ruth specifically the the historical films that I was watching are really drew on a lot of them um, were, were the films about AIDS. Um, so I remember seeing How to Survive a Plague at Sundance, because I don't even consider myself really a historical filmmaker. I rarely make films about the past. I'm almost always uh, following things unfolding. But I remember seeing How to Survive a Plague. I was at the premiere at Sundance. Hold, hold, usually I'm asking people to hold the microphone closer, if you can just hold it a little further. I'm talking too loud. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, and I just remember how incredible, the editing of that film, how powerfully uh, it was edited. I think there was a film at Sundance a couple years before, maybe even the year before called, I think it was called When We Were Here by David Weissman about AIDS in San Francisco. Um, so in making this film specifically, I was, draw I was watching a lot of those films on how to retell that part of Dr. Roos' past. Uh, Todd, in the case of Apollo 11, when I think of this question for you, there are already uh, strong films uh, made about NASA footage. In fact, at the end of your film, your dedication is to two filmmakers who uh, previously made films about NASA missions. Um, can you talk about those films that, that, uh, that you were giving that dedication to? Yeah, I mean, I like being called a space nerd, but I'm really a, uh, as much a movie nerd. So, uh, And I was such a fan of all these large format films uh, from the 50s mainly. Uh, and it really started here, uh, you know, uh, kind of Toronto and New York City. Uh, and a filmmaker by the name of Francis Thompson uh, was uh, really instrumental in doing a lot of experimental films uh, with large format, these Tadeo cameras. They're running through the streets of New York and really experimenting with uh, form uh, and, and structure. Uh, you know, right before, uh, you know, D.A. Pennybaker, Chris Hedges were, you know, uh, and, and Robert Drew were doing their thing uh, with direct cinema in the 60s. Francis fact, Thompson was a real mentor to Pennybaker. Absolutely, he's a godfather. Uh, in fact, Pennybaker made a film called Day uh, Daybreak Express. That was his first film, which was a real love letter to one of Francis Thompson's film called New York, New York, uh, which is a really great experimental uh, film. So uh, I was always a fan of those and if you're lucky here in New York you can go and they'll play some of the prints like uh, MoMA has a lot of uh, Francis's uh, original prints Museum of the Moving Image etc so um, just being a fan of those, that style of film and also those filmmakers and then lo and behold along comes Apollo 11 I, I you know, get to work on it uh oh uh -oh. must be talking too much uh, <laughs> is this mic cutting out this no. mic's cutting out uh oh hey hey all right um and uh, lo and behold, uh, one of Francis Thompson's... You know what, Ryan, why don't you give him... Joe, we've got two mics here that try. could use swapping okay, out. Okay, that seems like it's working. We'll just pass the mic. Uh -huh. Oh, you want to hold on the mic? Thanks, Asif. All right, that's great. Um, filmmakers working together. It's a real community. Um, 
But uh, a lot of the imagery that ended up in Apollo 11, and the reason why we dedicated the uh, film, uh, at the end we give two credits to Al and Theo. And Theo is Theo. Al Al Reinhardt. Al Reinhardt and Theo Kameka. And Theo Kameka was the editor on that film, uh, or one of Francis Thompson's early film called To Be Alive Shortly. He shot that shortly after uh, New York, New York. Um, it won an Academy Award, Best uh, Short Subject in 1964, played at the World's Fair out here. Um, and, uh, and, and so Theo directed a film called Moonwalk One, uh, which had a lot of footage that uh, we utilized for Apollo 11. Um, and then Al Reiner, I uh, was lucky enough to become friends with him uh, towards the end of his life. Uh, he unfortunately passed away while we were working on Apollo 11, but he did uh, For All Mankind in the 80s and was a screenwriter on uh, Apollo 13. Um, Asif, uh, you've now made uh, three films that uh, deal with history, or very recent history, Senna, Amy, and now uh, Diego Maradona. You also come from a background of making uh, fiction films. Um, but I, I wonder if there are historical documentaries or one that you want to cite that is meaningful to you. I mean, I, I went to film school, so I did see a lot of the kind of great um, kind of documentary kind of heroes of the past but but because i kind of grew up making fiction films and the film that i saw which was much more recent was when we were kings and i remember seeing it in london at the empire leicester square which is like the biggest cinema in leicester square and hearing the music and seeing muhammad ali in his prime one of my heroes on the big screen i found it so emotional watching that film and it was something about just going back in time to seeing him the way he... And at the time when I saw it, I, he would have still been alive. But, you know, he was in his latter stages of his life. So that had a quite a heavy kind of imprint on me, I think. And I guess that was one of the films when I started to do Senna that I was like, having done fiction films and then trying to do docs, thinking, well, I don't think anyone's ever going to be a better Muhammad Ali than Muhammad Ali. To just let him be, just show him in his prime. And I guess with Senna, with Amy, and then with Maradona, it's like just let them, just let them tell the story. Let them be the person. Um, when we were Kings had Talking Head interviews, it had kind of, which at the time I remember thinking, much as I love some of these people, I don't think they need to be commenting <laughs> on him. He's the one I want to watch. So that that was probably the film. You know, I did see. I was in. A student, when I remember seeing, um, I was in Chicago at the Chicago Film Festival when Hoot Dreams came out, and I saw that at the cinema. So for me, a, a lot of it was seeing these films at the cinema and thinking, I want to make docs that are made for the big screen like that. And I think Hoop Dreams had a big effect, I think, as well. That was another one that just, I don't know if that counts necessarily. These are more re- recent, but it was just showing the story of people through the footage that I... In one well, it, was, it had such longevity that it became a historical documentary by the time it was By the finished. end of it, yeah. Um, I want to uh, ask you each about your relationships to the, f- the figures in your film, and each of you have a uh, d- 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 different approach to that. Um, but I want to kind of get at, uh, you know, when you make a film about someone or Roger, in your case, a group of people, you know, you may feel some responsibility to telling their story right, but you also uh, feel a responsibility yourself as an artist to tell a story your own way, the way you see it. You're, you're not there to be their stenographer. Um, and, uh, and I wonder if you can uh, reflect on you know how you handle that balance. The you know whatever feeling you have of responsibility to get someone's story right, and um, and and how you also kind of seize your own ownership as as an artist to put your own perspective on it. Um, yeah. Well, dealing with an institution like the Apollo, obviously, it's an incredible huge responsibility and burden because it's it's eighty five years of history. Uh, all the greatest artists of black artists of our time, um, comedians, dancers, and um, so I felt a, a lot of pressure. Um, but for me, you know, when I and, was and also an institution that is constantly evolving and and has its own, you know, pride and sensitivity and you know and questions about you know how you carry an, an institution that was built for one time into another time. So. Exactly. 
And, um, and it's also the, the, the heartbeat of Harlem and the heartbeat of really of black America. No pressure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, for me, so um, when I was um, an NYU student, I used to go to amateur night. And um, what, was, what was unique and amazing to me when I first uh, sat there in the audience at amateur night was that sort of call and response interaction between the audience and the artist, that they're in dialogue together. And, um, and that reminded me of the black church. Um, I grew up in the black church and sang in the choir. And so that, that was a very familiar thing, but that's something that only sort of happens in the, in the black community and something uniquely Harlem. Um, and then I started sort of thinking about what did these acts mean to, to us as black people? What did these acts mean to America? And, um, and these acts, even when they weren't political, were very political, whether it was the temptations in their Italian suits and, and, and slick moves and what they were saying to America or Count Basie and the big band and the way they were dressed and carried themselves um, to like the very political stuff um, with <coughs> like Billie Holiday on that stage singing Strange Fruit which was a protest song that was outlawed in radio stations to James Brown, I'm Black and I'm Proud in 1968. So for me it was very political that the Apollo and as long as I stayed political and stay true to the politics, to what we were suffering and how we spoke to um, where we were in America, our place in America in the past, our place in America now, and in the, f in the future, then that was how I sort of, you know, sort of found my way through all this material and, um, and kept it sort of in a sort of, in a very emotional place because it's, because we, we've suffered greatly as black people in America and it's all evidence and it's all, S sung and danced and spoken on that stage. And kind of follow up to that, I'm curious, you know, the Apollo is obviously uh, an institution that lots of people feel ownership over, you know, whether you're some someone who's gone there for many years or whether you're someone who works there or perform there. And, um, you know, so I have to imagine that there was a lot of people along the way telling you you know what you should do or what you should not miss or and uh, and how did you filter that input and you know and and arrive at your own vision for what to include and what to leave out yeah um well so the the people who work there obviously um are very passionate about the place there are people who have worked at the apollo um billy mitchell in the, who's in the film 60 years he started as a um, just running errands, and um, James Brown put him through college. I mean, that's how that's how connected he's had every job at the Apollo. So there are people who obviously are very passionate, and they want the entire history. You know, if something's left out, you know, they're upset. But I have 90 minutes. I, I <laughs> I'm like, this is a 90 minute film. So um, it was a lot. Of, it was dealing with the the sort of politics of the people who work there, and what the Apollo. The Apollo also. The, the president of the Apollo and the board, you know, they all had their own sort of agendas. But for me, I just stuck to what was in my, you know, what was in my heart, what I felt um, the story is, and that is the, the, the politics, and that is what was going on in Harlem, what was going on in America, and staying true to that, and sort of ignoring all that, because I could have made, um, you know, 10 films. I mean, you could make a film just about James Brown and his relationship to the Apollo. Um, you know, that was his home. I mean, he had his funeral there. So, uh, so you you kind of just got to filter that all out and just stay true to what what I want to say. But uh, Ryan, in your portrait of Dr. Ruth Westheimer, it's a very celebratory uh, portrait. You're 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 not there to dig up controversy, uh, especially, but. Uh, but she she's also someone who has a long life. She's over 90 years old. Um, and uh, uh, and so I'm curious how you, you know, look to find a focus in that uh, story and how you navigated between other people who might have opinions about how to tell Dr. Ruth's story, including Dr. Ruth herself. Uh, well, if, if you see my film, the climax of the film is 1981, which is the year that Dr. Ruth blew up and became a celebrity when she moved from being an academic to the Dr. Ruth that we all know. Um, that's my birth year is 1981. So 
I grew up with Dr. Ruth being ubiquitous, her voice being ubiquitous, whether it was on the radio or on the television, but I was young. I was a child in the 80s and then a teenager in the 90s when she was at the height of her fame. And then she left television on her own accord. Yeah, she pull your mic. <laughs> um, I'll learn one time. I'm just, I'm just still, like imagining how it's going to sound recorded on the uh, on a podcast. Oh, you're so, thinking about the podcast. Yeah, I'm always I'm always I'm one part host, one part radio engineer. Uh, so I didn't I didn't really understand the impact of Dr. Ruth when I was asked if I wanted to have lunch with her. It was mo I more more said yes as a novelty. My actual first response was I don't make. Uh, historical or archival films because uh, I thought Dr. Ruth seems so old to me in the 80s and 90s that if she's around she must be 120 um, and the, the producer said to me like oh no Dr. Ruth is still teaching at two universities she's publishing a couple books she's on Good Morning America tomorrow so I jumped at the opportunity to have lunch with her um, and it was after oh, no, it was a dinner after that dinner we went to a restaurant on the Upper East Side after that dinner, which was so fun, obviously, she pulled up her chair next to me. She sat with her hand on my hand the entire time. She was full of life. She was 88 at the time, so I knew her 90th birthday would be looming. I knew there would be a lot going in on in her life that I could follow. Uh, but it was after that dinner, as we were walking out, and she was getting into her car, where uh, she calls every car Mr. Uber. Uh, I had gotten her a lift, but when she arrived, she called him Mr. Uber, and as she was getting in, uh, a gay gentleman, I'm gay, but he was probably 15 years, not that much older than me, came up and did what I've seen happen hundreds, if not thousands of times now. It's in our film a couple times with Jonathan Capehart, the Washington Post journalist, when he interviews her, saying, like, you changed my life. Some version of that. And I've seen that happen with, with m uh, queer people, women, refugees, people with simple sexual problems, people with complicated sexual problems. So that's when I started realizing, that's when I started to feel the responsibility. Like, if, oh, if I'm gonna make this film, this isn't a just about the funny old grandma on television with the accent who was entertaining us all. This is about a woman who, who saved people's lives, literally. Um, and so that's when I think the film became something much more important. And I also didn't know Dr. Ruth's backstory. And that's where I really had to fight her a little bit, ironically, because she doesn't, she's probably the most famous therapist in the US and she's so out of touch with her own emotions and doesn't like to talk about her past. But once I discovered that, I, I knew that needed to be a large part of the film. So that was really where I had to convince her of that her backstory was gonna be a significant part of the film as well as her family. Like her first rule when I met her was, you will never meet my family. Um, I'm famous for talking about orgasms and erections. My children, my grandchildren, they all have their own lives. They don't need to be associated with me. Most of them don't even have her last name, so most people don't know that they're Dr. Ruth's family. And that was a big, uh, I, that was a big back and forth with her, I, I would say, is trying to convince her that I wanted her family to be uh, not just a part of the film, but a large part of the film. Um, Todd, in uh, the case of Apollo 11, uh, many of the people who were part of that mission 50 years ago are uh, still alive. Um, and, and then you also have the community, of, as you referred to it, space nerds who feel uh, very invested uh, in that story. I I know that uh, you've told me that um, past films that have been made about NASA. You know, people will be kind of critical, nitpicky of like you know that shot does not match that shot. You know, that's taken from a different mission. Um, so, can you talk about some of the responsibility you felt uh, telling this story and what your interactions were with uh, with the people who had lived it? Yeah, um, everyone you just mentioned, we just decided to include them in the process. Um, you know, uh, we really saturated ourselves and uh, everyone that worked on it from, uh, you know, uh, the researchers to my producers, to uh, sound designer, uh, music composer, everybody. We all just, um, we researched everything, we watched everything. And then, um, you know, shortly into the process, we had discovered this uh, the 65 millimeter film uh, that hadn't been seen. So it was very, my first thought was we need to show 
the people that would really appreciate this, and that was the families and the people that had been steeped in this stuff for you know the better half of 50 years. So, um, and once they saw the footage, I think it you know it it spoke to them as much as it did us, and uh, I think they felt as incumbent as we did to you know um, uh, help us and and telling the story as accurately as we could. Um, and Can I ask you, since you've referred to large format and 65 millimeter, um, you know, for people in this audience who maybe have grown up with uh, video and never dealt with uh, large format or, or any format of, uh, of film, um, can you talk about what the significance is of 65 millimeter film? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, today it's IMAX pretty much across the board. Um, but back in the day, uh, in the 50s, that was, uh, first of all, you had 16 millimeter that a lot of people know of, and, and 35 millimeter, 16 millimeter in documentaries is, uh, you know, it changed the, uh, with handheld cameras, it really changed the face of documentaries in the 60s. So. And 16 millimeter would have been what? D.A. Pennebaker and exactly. Al Mazels and Yep, Drew all Pen the great Lee masters yeah. work in that. Carry a little chart. Mm. Yeah, I need like a laser pointer. <laughs> yeah. Camera yeah. Yesterday. Bring film with you. Yeah. Because I don't know if that makes sense to young people. Yeah, so if you think of just not to get too technical, but 16 millimeter is literally 16 millimeters the width. And then 35 millimeter is almost twice that. And then 65 millimeter, oh my God, it's you know almost double that. Uh, and then IMAX came along and it's even a little bit better than 65 millimeters. So um, but in the 50s, uh, they came up with large format film as a response to television uh, that was uh, going to threaten the cinemas. Sound familiar? Uh, with streaming and everything else. So, um, uh, Large format just meant that the picture was richer because you were capturing it on that much larger a, a frame. And it's very difficult to work with, too. Uh, I mentioned that film, Moonwalk One. Uh, we had the rushes and the dailies uh, for those, which, uh, for anybody that doesn't know, is just the negatives uh, that were shot in the camera. Uh, and they see, had in the trailer, you see that incredible shot of the, the biggest tractor you've ever seen in the <laughs> world, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. you know, dwarfing uh, a, the, a, a human being in front of it. That's uh, f that from was Moonwalk One, yeah. or, or shot from Moonwalk One. Yep, exactly. So, uh, but that, um, uh, when in Moonwalk One, um, they just had so many problems developing uh, the film uh, that they switched after a, a couple days of filming and they went to 35. So, Moonwalk One was released in 35 millimeter, and you know, uh, that and all of the technical film that NASA had produced uh, with. Uh, another group of filmmakers um, that was just locked away for waiting for technology to come around, really to be able to uh, develop it in an efficient way. Um, so that, but that was kind of one story of it. When we started working with the families and, uh, you know, whether it was a flight controller, like everybody has a story. Uh, you know, the film's been out for a little while and we get people coming out and it's so, uh, it's, you know, I like to sit through the screenings and, and talk to people afterwards because they're all, everyone's connected. They have a, um, a story to tell. Either they lived through it, didn't know how complex it was, how many people were involved, uh, but now they're bringing their, um, you know, their kids uh, to the cinema. Um, and it's a really cool to see that experience. Um, and I really like bringing people that were involved, whether it's the astronauts like Buzz Aldrin, Michael Collins, Neil Armstrong's uh, sons, Rick or Mark, um, flight controls. We had the first uh, uh, female uh, engineer that was in um, uh, Cape Canaveral, as it's called today, uh, sitting in the room. The sea of like. Is, is that a woman? Yeah, that we that's see? Joanne Morgan. You saw her in the trailer. Um, first flight controller, first time in the room was uh, that day, uh, July 16th in 1969. And she ended up having a 40-year career with NASA and has inspired countless uh, female engineers to um, uh, go today. And in fact, over 40% uh, of flight controllers now are female. Um, so uh, anyways, it's really great to, um, you know, it, to, uh, to see that uh, when we show the film. But also, um, it it's just goes to show you how many people were involved in all of this. That's what always gets me um, is, is you know, how many hundreds of thousands it took to... Right. We, we, we think of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and maybe Michael Collins, uh, but you are paying tribute to, to all the other people. And it speaks to the, the value of large format. We've seen a lot of these images before, but they're like, you know, postage size, you know, a little square. Uh, but when you see it in that kind of quality, 
um, the emotion just pops off the screen and you are, you know, you, you go along uh, for the ride with them uh, and you know that they represent all of us. Um, Asif, uh, of all the films we're talking about today, Diego Maradona might be the most complicated uh, character uh, just in terms of his self-mythologizing, his uh, unreliability as a narrator of his own life. and Not always likable, let's be honest. <laughs> not always likable. Um, so uh, uh, I mean, can you talk about what you felt your relationship was to him, what you owed to him in telling his story, and what you owed to yourself in telling that story? Yeah, I, I guess what I have always tried to do, and I have to kind of talk about all three of the films in a way, because... First of all, my, my aim was always, like, even though these stories are kind of history or they happened in the past or people had died before I met them or Diego Maradona's career ended a long time ago, my intention is always to do a lot of research, talk to a lot of people and investigate the story or the character and then figure out my version of it. Um, and then it's my version of truth always. Um, hopefully I've done enough research and eliminated... Why don't you take Todd's microphone? It sounds like your microphone is a little scratchy yeah, there. Batteries. Um, and then, then it's really important, actually, because when I saw the title, I remember thinking, my aim is to make them feel contemporary and to make it feel like this is happening now and to not feel like a history lesson, to not make it feel like this is in the past, but actually somehow make it seem like you're in this person's life and we're telling it in the present. Um, and so that's really important. And that's, again, one of the reasons why I, I personally don't cut in and out of the time period. It's like you figure out when your story is going to take place and you stick with it. And so you hopefully you get lost in whether it's Senna's story, Amy's story, or in this case, trying to figure out how to tell Maradona's story. Along the way, you're dealing with, if they're alive, the person and their lawyers uh, and their kids and the ones that he's recognised and the ones he hasn't recognised, you know, all the people that have been left behind, the r damage that someone like Diego's left behind, or in the case of someone who's not alive, the, the people who are still kind of making money, the estate, you know, people like that are ar bothered about how the image is going to be portrayed. And so I am aware of them and I have to manage that, but I also try to do it in such a way with my team, which is to say, you have to just leave us alone and let us make the film. But I do show people the film before it's out. I, I've, I do regularly screen films um, to check if I've got something wrong. And if I have got something wrong, it's because I've, we've chosen to conflate the story because of time or because there is a particular key thing that happened which changed this character's life. But I can't show you that, but I can show you this, and that alludes to that moment. And I may take the dialogue from there and the sound from there and the music from there, but I'm going to show you this. That's what you have to do. You know, everything's edited. And it is no different to me than making a fiction film. I don't think docs are more real than fiction. I don't think fiction necessarily has to be more kind of constructed than docs. I think it's the same stuff, use the same tricks. It's all cheating. It's all filmmaking is a game of deceit. So is, you know, f football is. And it's all your version of a truth of someone's life, which is impossible to squeeze into two hours and 90 minutes. So everything is like your take. But so you've got to be able to justify it and argue, <laughs> particularly when Amy's dad then says, this is not true, you're a son and so on. And then you've got to say, well, actually, I know this, this, this and this, but I'm just showing you that. Because that was a particular case. Amy was a very tough one uh, because it was so recent. Amy had only died less than a year when I started making that film. Maradona's different because a lot of people are so terrified of him. And getting to him is a different thing because of... And the people he hung out with are kind of scary. And so, you know, when you're going to Naples and you don't know who the Camorra are when you're in Naples, you don't know who's mates with these people. It's not clear. That's a whole different set of circumstances. Who will talk to you on the record, off the record, all of that. It's complex. What was the experience of showing uh, Diego Maradona the film? It was really good. It hasn't actually happened yet, but it's good. <laughs> Fantastic. I thought it went very well. He didn't turn up to the screening, but um, no, he hasn't seen it. That's the funny thing. You know, the guys, everyone thinks because someone's alive, they're going to be bothered. But when you're dealing with Diego Maradona, he couldn't give a shit. I don't know if he knows who I am. I don't know if he knows there's a film. I don't know if he cares or if he cares so much that he can't, Maradona can't show weakness. That's kind of in the film. 
Diego's this sensitive guy. Maradona's never... So he can't ever admit he's ever made a mistake. So if there's something in the film that shows he may have made a mistake in his life, that he's not going to recognise that doesn't exist. So he's not seen it. We were in Cannes, he didn't come. We were... You know, when we last spoke, you know, that was just before, I guess, Cannes. And we were yeah. trying, and he didn't come. And then there's been... I was in Argentina recently. I was in Buenos Aires. He was over there. I was over here. Now, more and more you realise, is it him or is it his team? That's the truth. You know, more and more you realise it's not... The person gets the bad rep, but it's often it's the entourage where the people who decide who they, who they know is in town and who isn't. He's no idea I was there, probably. You're not texting with him. Pardon me? You're not texting with him. Do you know, he hasn't replied to my WhatsApp messages for a while. No, no. I, I, you don't go to him. Amy didn't have a mobile phone, you know? No one could talk to her directly. And with Maradona, you talk to girlfriends, you talk to the lawyer, you talk to so-and-so, you talk to everyone around him, the entourage. And then they get fired, and then you've got to find out who's the next guy in the house that, you know... Oh, there's a guy called Imran. Give me Imran's number. I think I've got a chance of Imran. And then I talk to myself into his house. That's kind of how it works. It's all detective work as much as artistic in any way. Uh, I want to uh, ask each of you about... Uh, your relationship to the history that you were covering. And I mean, I think when you immerse yourself in a specific period, um, some things are glaringly obvious about what's different in that period, whether it's a, uh, you know, whether it's something technological or whether it's a, um, maybe in the case of Dr. Ruth, a, uh, an attitude towards sexual mores. Um, and uh, I mean, Roger, let me start with you. Um, you know, when you were, when, when you're putting yourself in the history of the Apollo, you're putting yourself in, uh, you know, different layers of uh, America's relationship with race. Um, and, uh, and I wonder if, um, if you felt a need to, uh, to, to frame that you know, to, to, to make it feel as powerful as it did then, considering that we live in a different time now, if that makes sense. Well, yeah. Um, I don't think we necessarily live in a different time now. And that was the point. Um, because um, um, s considering how much has changed for black people in America, um, not a lot has actually changed. <laughs> and in, um, you know... When I started researching this, and in, and I started seeing the footage of when the Apollo opened, it's like 1934, and it's Ella Fitzgerald, and it's segregated Harlem, and it's a shooting of an unarmed black man, and they're rioting in Harlem. And that story happened over and over and over again. At least three times every decade, a young black man is shot by the, uh, Ella, by the uh, New York police, and there's rioting. And it continues to happen today. Um, so um, for me, uh, being a black man in America, um, that was really the key to sort of you know, telling the story. And then when um, Tanahasi Coates com came along, who is, um, for me, um, the voice of my generation, the, 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 who speaks to the truth and the reality of, of what we are living in this country as black people, um, then that was the, the hook for me and how to um, connect the past to the present, uh, to connect, to, to relate to young people, um, you know, in the age of Trayvon Martin and Eric Garner, and this was this was continuing to happen, and to to bring that sort of seminal work of his between the world and me um, to the stage with uh, all the talent that um, was on that stage. Uh, that was it's a story that's that's con doesn't change in America, and it, and um, and that doesn't seem, you know, not to be sort of bleak about it, but it doesn't seem to be getting better. It seems to be getting worse. So it's, it became for me personally this sort of rallying cry, call to action to um, black people that um, we must use art and music to uh, voice our truth, um, to uh, speak to our situation in this country, 
Uh, and, um, and that stage needs to continue to do that because that stage is really the, the center and the heart of black America through the arts. Brian, in, in telling the story of uh, Dr. Ruth, uh, you talk about 1981 being the year that um, she really took off. Uh, there is a lot that's changed about our attitudes towards sexual mores uh, since then. How did you can navigate the, 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 you know, the difference between the, the attitudes of, of that day to contemporary times? Yeah, well, I, I, I hate to echo Roger, but I think it's very similar. When I was making this film, trying to tie the past to the present, unfortunately, so many of the things that Dr. Ruth was preaching or teaching in the 80s and 90s continue to bubble up, and they're very simple lessons. Like, if you watch the film, many, many of her taglines that she says over and over, like, respect is not debatable when it comes to sexual minorities. There is no normal. Uh, people of all so socioeconomic classes deserve access to family planning. And all of these issues that she was revolutionary at the time and probably ruffling a lot of feathers, unfortunately still ruffles a lot of feathers. So it wasn't hard to tie the past to the present in that way because what she's teaching still <laughs> needs to be taught. Um, I found it very interesting to make this film in the post Me Too era because my previous project had been The Keepers, which is also about sexuality, but it's about child sex abuse, and that was in the pre-Me Too era, um, where there was a whole different, I think, set of rules in, fi in filmmaking around sexuality, but also within the office. And then in this film, I was making a film in the post-Me Too era in an office, you know, with probably 15 people working on it, many people in their 20s, when HR departments were probably more sensitive than ever to sexuality being talked in the workplace, and meanwhile, in my office, you know, we're debating whether we include the scene where she's talking about, you know, you don't have to show you love someone by swallowing semen versus whether we're going to be using the scene about uh, wh whether anal sex is appropriate in a marriage, you know? And we were having these conversations nonstop. And so I think Dr. Ruth, you know, I think the magic of Dr. Ruth, which is, which I often get asked like, who's the no new Dr. Ruth? And I don't think there is one, and I don't think there ever can be one. I think the magic of Dr. Ruth, and it was then and it still is now, is that she was so uh, neutralizing, that she was so all-pleasing. Like earlier you said my film it was, was celebratory, um, and I wouldn't argue that, and that it wasn't drumming up controversy. I wish there were more controversy around Dr. Ruth. You know, I delved everywhere thinking, of course she must have pissed everyone off in the 80s and 90s, but the magic of Dr. Ruth, I think, was that her persona, this sweet grandma, four foot seven, was able to disarm people, whether it was people looking for help or whether it was the religious right or whether it was conservatives. You know, we were just we were just at the Four Seasons, and I saw Newt Gingrich see Dr. Ruth, and I saw his eyes light up. You know, uh, do you think that would be the last person? Because everything that she's been preaching is contrary uh, to what he stands for. But uh, I think that's the magic of what she was able to do was like disarm a country that was so puritanical, and use that disarming persona to, to as teachable moments. Um. Todd, we were talking before about you know, the only woman uh, in the room uh, at, at that NASA mission. Um, and you know, looking at the footage in Apollo 11, it, I, I mean, it is like all white guys in crew cuts, uh, um, it, you know, like a, a other, another world doesn't exist. Um, and, uh, and I wonder in your, you know, engagement with, um, with that history, like you know, some of the you know choices that you were making to you know to represent that, you know, what to leave in and what to to leave out. Yeah, um, I mean, I'd also like to comment on kind of the the past and the present because when we were working on the film, a lot gets made of the footage, uh, but we also had this eleven thousand hours of audio, um, and it was fascinating. Uh, we had to just kind of divvy it up, so all of us, a lot of us, were here in New York, so you would. You know, uh, like I'm sure everybody, we work like you know, uh, you're you're like going into work when the sun before the sun comes up, and you go home after the sun goes down. So what was significant for me was that the moon was always out. So we would listen to this audio because there were no, you know, there was no uh, transcript. So I'd be walking 
I live like, you know, 15 blocks from uh, my office. So I'd walk, um, uh, you know, listening to this stuff and you'd look up at the moon and a lot of times they were talking on the loops, uh, they call it the loops in Mission Control about things that were happening uh, presently in 1969. And, uh, you know, the Summer of Love 68 had happened. Um, you know, RFK was assassinated, Martin Luther King was assassinated, um, you had, you know, Vietnam, all the socio-political things going on, um, and I couldn't help but, you know, you walk the city streets at, you know, midnight to 3 a.m., <laughs> you're going to see some stuff, and that, you know, even, I live in Brooklyn, you know, and sometimes we were doing our work here in Manhattan, I take the train back, you know, late at night, early in the morning, Listen to this thing. Listen to these things, and every time you see a cop car, every time you see a scene play out, um, I couldn't help but just kind of think about how we're sandwiched, um, you know, into uh, this world and how things have changed, but they really haven't. Um, there were so many similarities. I might as well have been listening to something that was happening last week, you know, and it was very um, interesting uh, and uh, and very philosophical, you know, I'd get very emotional listening to a lot of that stuff. Um, and there's so much of it that's not in the film. Um, but um, to your point, uh, you know, it was all white guys, all of it. Um, and uh, they were young. Um, these people were in their 20s for the most part. Um, and but one thing that we did discover, which I'm very proud of, is we did find kind of these pockets of resistance to that. Uh, for instance, um, I mentioned Joanne Morgan. Well, the first uh, flight controller in Mission Control. She worked in the back room. Was a woman named Poppy Northcutt, and she was uh, she had a very important job. She was uh, to do. She did all the math for the return trajectories to get the guys home. Uh, she was a mathematician, still around, uh, you know, and uh, she played a very prominent part, just not on Apollo 11, but Apollo 13. Um, and then also just doing the research, watching footage, we had always seen um, this black man that was included in the front room uh, uh, scenes. Well, as it turns out, he had a much more important role. Uh, when we were looking at the footage, it didn't look like he should be in the front room. It just looked like he was in another room somewhere. Uh, so when we were engaged with NASA's history uh, office, we found out that he actually had a much more important role. Uh, and we, we designed an entire scene around him. He was in a spacecraft analysis room in a back room uh, with a group that he led. Um, and he was in charge of uh, taking radiation levels for the astronauts each night before they went to bed. And then his group also monitored solar flare activities. Uh, and if anybody knows anything about solar flares, um, if you get a big one, it could cripple a spacecraft and the guys would be dead and lost to time. So uh, we had satellites all over the Earth. It was his group and, and him that uh, were to monitor all that and then they would you know, radio up to the front room and they can communicate to the spacecraft to take evasive action if needed. Um, so it was fun to discover these are interesting and very important to uh, you know, uncover these little pieces of history that have been lost to time. Uh, and I'm very proud of that and the work of everyone I you know on the team uh, to do that and to uh, inform the historical record. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, I'd, I would love for future filmmakers just do a film about just that guy. It's so interesting, you know. Um, in a minute, I'm going to go to the audience for questions, so uh, get yours uh, prepared. Uh, but Asif, let me continue this uh, theme with you. you. I mean, you describe that in your films, you're really trying to put people... Uh, in the moment, and so in this case, in the 1980s of uh, of Naples, uh, Italy, um, which uh, w w you know, which is a time of a lot of like really bad boy uh, celebrity sportsman uh, behavior, and um, Ryan talked about you know the um, the sensation in his mind looking through the prism of a kind of post Me Too era at. Um, at his material, I wonder if if you felt the same something similar uh, looking at that era w it through a contemporary lens. Yeah, I guess I guess you know we're talking about a kind of macho Latin sportsman, okay, uh, in southern Italy. So you've got this kind of 
there's a lot of uh, kind of cultural what context. Men, what men are meant to be like and how women are treated. And so this idea of saying, well, and it's about soccer player, football player. So the idea of finding kind of the key woman in his life and making sure his ex-wife and his girlfriend spoke and getting them to come on board. So it isn't just a film about guys. It's partly it's about things that are that have changed, the way, the brutality of the sport at the time and how it's changed. But then there's also these things that haven't changed because when we were getting into the film and you have like in this particular football is can be nasty, okay? So the chance that used to happen in the 80s from the north of Italy to southern Italy, where, which is essentially within Italy kind of racist, this kind of racism element, um, I didn't know at first. I heard about it. But then this is 1984, 1985, where the north looks down and they're like, you know, Neapolitans are dirty. You've got cholera. You should all be dead. Vesuvius, the volcano, should erupt and wash you with fire. That's the songs they sang in the 80s. Do you know what? They sang that last week. That hasn't changed. No one in Italy talks about this. That's the one of the things that was interesting about researching this film is that the power, the media, everything's controlled in the north of Italy. They still look down on southern Italy. You know, they still sing those songs. Bananas are being thrown on football pitches in Europe now because of everything that's going on in the world, kind of in terms of splitting people. You're with us, you're against us. This did used to happen in the 80s when I was younger, and it's happening again now in London. You know, London, you get people kind of singing racist chants. So there is an issue that's back in the ether, I think, now, racially. Um, there's another thing that was kind of interesting when researching this film. I've always, I've grown up with Diego Maradona. Okay, I can know what he looks like. There was a separate thing that happened, which is that he, in the film, was called by his friends a negrito, which is a very kind of toxic word in England because there was a player who was banned for a long period of time for using that word because in English, most people in England don't speak more than one language. It was translated as I'm not, I'll say the N word here. Um, but actually, it's a different meaning because Diego Maradona's dad is indigenous. So even though he doesn't look black, he's considered black because his dad is indigenous and he's sort of mixed race. And everyone in kind of Latin America in some way is. So there's all of these things that came out of the film, which a few people have sort of picked up on this. He felt he was treated because he's poor and his dad is indigenous. He's black as far as they're concerned over there. All the people in power in Latin America, in Argentina particularly, are white. I mean, in Brazil, similar with Ayrton Senna, you know, the educated, wealthy, look, all of the politicians are white and a lot of the sports people are black or mixed race. Um, so him coming over and playing in southern Italy and Neapolitans being treated in a really kind of negative way by the rest of the power structure made him feel at home. So that all came out of this kind of process. That, that was an interesting thing. I didn't know about any of that going in. Then there was this important thing about bringing out the female characters. The one person who consistently told the truth in Diego Maradona's life was this woman called Cristiana Sinagra, who he has a child with, who he denies having for 30 years. And everyone else was terrified of Diego Maradona, didn't want to upset him, wanted to stay in the gang. The one person, this young woman, 21 years old, who gets pregnant, all she did was tell the truth. He's like, you're the dad. You're the dad. You're the dad. That's your son. That's your son. And he took him 30 years to admit it. And that, that was a subplot that was in the movie. So there's a lot of stuff that was going on that was interesting. For a woman to do that in Naples when this guy's been treated like a god, she went through a lot of shit. You know, her son went through a lot of shit. So there's a lot of that what, that kind of came out of it, I guess. that's Now you look at it and you realise a lot of these sports people, you know, who are out there, we know who they are, who are cheats or doing drugs and doping, all that stuff. Often it's the women that bring them down. I'm kind of slightly obsessed with that subject matter of doping in sports. And it was interesting that with Diego Maradona, the one person in the way that got to admit some form of truth was this one girl who he had a kid with. Fascinating. Um, let's uh, go to the audience uh, for questions. If you uh, have questions about any of these films. Yes, this woman here.
Uh, so interesting question. If anyone didn't hear it, she's commenting that uh, most of the people we're talking about here are celebrities in some uh, way. And she wonders when y any of you are covering uh, individuals who aren't famous, does your approach to that change at all? I, I, I can speak to that a little bit because I've made both, like uh, Dr. Ruth, and I've made a film about Serena Williams where I was with Serena for a year. But all my other films have been about non-famous people, and I find that dynamic so interesting. Like entering those places and figuring out how to deal with uh, how a celebrity reacts in front of the camera versus I've never I've never figured out what the word for a non-celebrity is. I always say like a regular person, which <laughs> sounds so demeaning. But whatever <laughs> we call that person, it's it's a very different dynamic, and I love both. I love cracking the code of both with Dr. Ruth and Serena specifically. I very early on had to crack this idea that they were performers, especially Dr. Ruth. She would look straight into the camera because that's what she did for 20 years. A caller would call in and then she would address the person and it'd have to be like, whoa, 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 this looks very creepy. You're like looking into the camera, talking about, you know, your son learning about sexual education. It's not, it doesn't feel right in a documentary. So I'd have to like get her to lock eyes with me all the time, or if I was holding the camera, even move it a little bit so that she couldn't uh, do that. With regular people, the really condescending term, um, I feel like it's a lot. It's it's a lot longer process, but it's almost more enjoyable. So there, I end up with a lot more footage. Uh, that's probably about. That's probably many factors. Time demands. Like Serena Williams does not have the time for me to be asking her questions all day long. Like I would just sit at her house all day long and she would know I was waiting and then she would choose the moment where she'd be like, what do we need to accomplish today? And she was super efficient. Uh, but often that would cut both ways where it'd be like, that, well, that's not what I wanted. What I wanted with you was five hours where we could really just observe. With the regular people, I'll often spend days and get you know, 30 seconds of footage that makes it into the film. So I think it, it changes the ratio. For me, it's really changed the ratio of how much I shoot versus what makes it into the cut. But I love, I love working with both. And I kind of vacillate between the two in my career so far. Can I say something? I, I don't film people. So a lot of what's interesting with the famous people, I don't put, they expect a crew and a camera, and I don't bring a camera. And I try to do that to take it away from them performing. And then, for me, the most interesting kind of, for on Amy, for example, the people who were most honest and most emotional were her friends and her first manager that no one had ever heard of. So they were like the, the, the kind of truth. And often the real person, the person who it's about, is the least honest. So it's everyone else that tells you what's really going on. And so for me, it was the kind of balance of not putting people on camera, not bringing an entourage, therefore they don't have an entourage, and therefore it was kind of an interesting thing of kind of slightly with Diego Maradona and people like that, he's expecting people to be waiting for him. And I'm like, when I turned up, it's just me, and I'm recording it myself, and it was one of a person, that, that kind of calmed him down. So you record your interviews audio only? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. There's no camera. No. Even if you... Yeah, on wow. Senna, I started off by putting people on camera, and then I, I got rid of that quite quickly. I, I found it really interesting to not well, bring I the... I, I assumed he had a camera there just no. in case. No, I stopped doing that a while ago. Pardon me? No, I intended to, and then he, he kept me waiting for a week. So I was like, fuck that, never again. <laughs> but never also, again. like, when you approach, it doesn't matter whether they're famous or not famous. I found, I'm sure you guys agree, like, honesty is the best policy. So I probably take that, like, even more. I'm like, listen, it's going to take years. It's going to suck. You're probably going to hate a lot of this. But at the end, you know, it's going to be great. So just go down the road with it. It's trust is the main thing, particularly with people who are not in the business or people who are afraid because... Generally, if you're making a film, something happened, right? In the case of Amy, someone died. Their friend died. They did not trust the media. So the, the thing became, how can you build up trust? And because they didn't trust the media, the worst thing would have been me to turn up with a crew. And that was an interesting, really very emotional kind of process. And the, I would say the main thing is you don't force anyone. You don't push it. If they're not in the mood, then you walk away, and then you try again down the line. Roger, do you have anything to add in your experience? Um, well, I mean, I feel more responsibility when it's a, a regular person <laughs> because you can destroy their lives. Um, it's you, you have so much power over their, you're telling your reality and their story and 
um, if you fuck it up, if you are, if you say something that could really damage them, you, you show something that can really damage them, then you, you have to suffer the, you know, the, the guilt of that. So when I'm filming with a, a real person, I um, feel much more responsible. With a, with a celebrity, they, they have all kinds of means to stop the film. You know, they can just like, okay, we're going we're gonna to sue you. You know, so, um, but with a, a real person, they don't necessarily have that, that, sort of, that sort of power. So it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. All right, uh, we have time for one more question. Uh, right here. Ah, so uh, the question is, and we can open this up to everyone, about the origins of your projects. Were these projects that were brought to you? I mean, Ryan, you talked a little bit about uh, someone suggesting you make a film about Dr. Ruth, but uh, Roger, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, um, so the Apollo film had been in um, various forms of production and development for uh, seven, maybe seven years before I got involved. There were lots of different directors, uh, lots of attempts to make the film. Um, I think what happened is that the Apollo went to uh, CAA and they said, um, uh, we're, we're just gonna open it up to production companies and a production company in LA, White Horse Pictures, who have made a, a bunch of uh, sort of music-based films, um, won the bid and they um, had another director attached, a well-known director. <laughs> um, and uh, that- House of Capadio. <laughs> yes, it was- I'm still waiting for them to return my call. It was Capadio, <laughs> 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 it was House of Capadio. Um, no, it, uh, it's, 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 it was Lee Daniels. And so um, uh, Lee Daniels' um, producer, um, a woman named Effie, Effie T. Brown, um, called me and said, um, uh, Lee can't do this. He has a, his third series coming out on, on stars. And uh, he does, he's, so would you take it over? And I said, yes, I will take it over if um, you know, Lee kind of steps away from it completely. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so that's how, that's how it started. And um, so by the time I had gotten it, there had been so many treatments and so many versions and so many people. And there was like a sort of a, uh, 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 all these people I could sort of talk to actually who had um, you know tried and failed uh, to make it so uh, I, I was determined to sort of get it through because you're dealing with with something like this um, you're dealing with uh, sort of an institution and a board and the Apollo had a big say in um, in this you know sort of the choice of director I had to go and interview with like the CEO and you know various board members um, well, I'm getting a time uh, cutoff signal, and we do have another panel coming up here. Uh, I do have a, a podcast interview with Asif Kapadia on my pure nonfiction that we recorded uh, in March. Uh, you can hear uh, more from him. I want to let you know about some of these films playing at the festival. Uh, the Apollo is going to be playing uh, next Wednesday at 6.30 with producer Lisa Cortez uh, there for a Q&A. Uh, Apollo 11 is playing on Sunday morning uh, at 10.20. As, as Dr. Ruth already had its screenings, Diego Maradona is playing tonight uh, at 8.15, and Asif will be there if you had uh, further questions for him. Um, also, uh, next Tuesday at our Doc NYC Pro panels, uh, the composer from Apollo 11, Matt Morton, is going to be speaking on uh, a panel. Oh, there he is, Matt Morton right there is going to be uh, speaking on uh, a panel about, th uh, about composing the music uh, for our Tuesday composing uh, day. And also on Tuesday in our producing section for Doc NYC Pro, Lisa Cortez, the producer of the Apollo, um, is going to be on the panel about creative producing. So I hope you get to see some more of that. So we're going to take a 10-minute break uh, or so here before we reset the stage. Thank you all for being here. Thanks especially to Asif Kapadia, Todd Douglas Miller, Ryan White, and Roger Ross Williams. Thanks.